love that Oaklander, want to see that Oaklander, Oaklander, Oakland TV. Oaklander, Oaklander, Oakland TV. Peace of heaven with our new exit on 287. We can be seen on channel 20. That's our channel 20. Good evening, and welcome once again to The Oaklander. I'm your host, Al Giacomo. Before we begin the program tonight, I would like to thank the many viewers for their kind words on our 50th anniversary show. And still, we've received some other viewpoints in letters via the internet. OK TV crew member Andrew Stewart gives us an update from the mail tube. Andrew, what's up in the tube? I don't know. Let's check it out, Al. Here you go. Let's see what we got here. Let's see what we have in the tube. All right. Put that right there. All right. Uh, we have three letters here. And the first letter says, To the staff members at OKTV, happy anniversary to all of the o Oaklanders for their 50th program. Great job. We all enjoyed watching Black History Month with Professor Muhammad A. Rahman. His studies of history and anthropology abroad in Senegal, West Africa, have served Professor Muhammad well for he speaks so candidly about the origins of civilization. This is TV at its best, having a recognized authority speak knowledgeably about a subject which connects to every living person on our planet is just that. Too often TV fails to meet a standard of even of mediocrity, filling our ears and eyes with sounds and sights which most experts deem of no value. Indeed, much of it is harmful, especially to our children, most of whom watch too much TV with too much of it being harmful. Various industries involved are tactically uh, acknowledging this fact by offering various devices to block specific channels. All Oaklander programs we have seen are of wide interest, but this particular one begs for a parent-child sit-down, allowing parents to explain any part children don't understand as well as a general discussion about the program. I have taped this program to view with my nine-year-old granddaughter so that I may stop the tape for any necessary explanations or discussions. Again, a big thank you to the Oaklander volunteers for their hard work, and another big thank you to Professor Rahman for giving us the opportunity for a serious, dis serious discussion with our young people. Yours truly, Carolyn Karg. All right, that's wonderful. And we're on to uh, letter number two. It's from uh, Janet Pfeiffer, uh, who is an author, motivational speaker from Oak Ridge, New Jersey. And she writes, hello to all. Congratulations on your 50th anniversary show with the Oaklander. I am so happy for you. I would love to return as a guest on the show. I really enjoyed it last time. As you can see in my enclosed booklet, the variety of topics that I now speak on has greatly expanded. Anger is still a favorite of many, but the other subjects are gaining in popularity as well. I'm teaching a lot at local adult schools. Would be great via the Oaklander to share these programs with people in the area. So give a call. I'd love to be back on the show and continued success. Signed, sincerely, Janet Pfeiffer. Janet Pfeiffer, she was a great guest about two years ago. Okay. And the last letter we have, this is kind of a long <coughs> one, so stay with us here. Uh, it says, Dear Oaklander, congratulations on 50 shows. I have noticed your host almost never speaks of our president, good, bad, or indifferent. Maybe you would like to talk about these subjects on your show. I am very dismayed about the future now that has been played out in the Senate. As a believer in the democratic process, I was hoping that our senators would find the courage to remove this totally corrupted and unsuited man from the White House. I hope and pray that the voters in their various states will find the courage and resolve 
to remove these senators as they have no business in our Congress. Now that Bill Clinton has won, what can we as Americans expect? Clinton will be on a roll trying to get his pet ideologies codified into law in the name of doing the people's business. We may see a new initiative to enact a socialistic health care system. We will see global warming placed on the front burner as the road is paved for an Al Gore candidacy. Bear in mind that Gore hates private automobiles. Those who enjoy boating and general aviation can expect new attacks on their pastimes in the name of environmentalism. Anything that uses gasoline will be endangered. Those who enjoy shooting sports can expect a new round of attacks as Clinton unleashes those persons in, the, in this administration with a pathological hatred of pri private gun ownership. Perhaps we'll see a Stalin-like purge of the so-called vast right-wing conspiracy. We can uh, expect new taxes to be donated to the International Monetary Fund for dubious nation-building projects in other countries and look for expanded police powers for the FBI and the CIA under the banner of the war on drugs. Look for an expansion of NAFTA and similar trade agreements that will ultimately destroy your income. What you will not see is an increasing of your freedoms and a lessening of your tax burden. Jobs will become more scarce, not numerous. As the police become more militarized, they will become more arrogant and murderous. We must accept that Clinton is not an American as known that word to mean. He is an inter-Nazi, an international socialist. He dreams of a simple, a single uh, world government where you are directed from afar. He wants an international court where you can be flown to without habeas corpus or bail, tried in a language that you don't understand under laws that you may not be aware of without the protections of the Constitution. Finally, you will be imprisoned in a place far from your home with no chance of a visit from friends and relatives. A core belief among inter-Nazis is that there are too many people in the world and we must eliminate vast quantities of our populations. This belief is known as substantial development. It is the, this belief that drives their desire for partial birth abortion and health care. Health care is a way to channel all drugs, medicines, knowledge, and care through one system. That system will be subject to administrative foul-ups and thereby create a de facto denial of critical items and services which will, take, which will make a contribution to the stated goal of lowering the population by 2 billion people in, by the year two, 2030. There are those who hearing these things will say I am paranoid, but I assure you that I am only quoting them from their own mouths. And that uh, letter was sent to us from George M. from Butler, New Jersey. Well, that sure really does uh, have a mouthful there, doesn't yes, it, Yes, there's Andrew? a lot in that one. I think um, what we have here is um, a real call for, um, for a bumper sticker. Yeah. It calls for a bumper sticker. So, Andrew, I think we will uh, present him with the I love my amoral, narcissistic, megalomaniacal, so sociopathical president. So, uh, George from Butler, this will be coming to you. So, thank you for your letters. Try saying that ten times fast. Try That's saying tough. that ten <laughs> times fast. All right. And now, on with the show. It's strange that a child this young knows the word cancer, but Tiara is intimately familiar with the disease. She has it, but she also has St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where doctors and scientists work relentlessly to find a cure. To learn how you can help, call St. Jude, 1-800-USS-JUDE. Over the decades, Americans have spent countless billions, if not trillions of dollars on treatment or prevention of devastating diseases such as heart disease, breast and other cancers. And people we know who have suffered through these trials see it as a part of the drama known as the human condition. Still, the incidence of insulin-dependent diabetes, leukemia, osteoporosis, and asthma plague young and old are growing at alarming rates. Uh, why is this? Could there be a common thread that can explain the causes um, our guest tonight uh, thinks he may have found a key factor 
Robert Cohen, author of Milk, The Deadly Poison, and his field of interest is biological research, uh, more focused in psycho endocrinology or the influence of hormones on brain chemistry and its behavior on mammals. Robert Cohen, the not milkman, believes that cow's milk may be the catalyst behind many of these tragic illnesses and the cover-up that exists to deny us the truth. Welcome to our show, Robert. Nice to be here, Al. Thank you. Did I, did I get that right? Is it psychoneuroendocrinology? That's pretty good. It's a $50 word. You it did it surely justice. is, good and job. I'll take that $50 after the show. <laughs> Robert, you've studied many facets. Um, could you start off by giving us a little bit of your credentials on your education? Sure, I used to run a lab. I have a degree in psychoneuroendocrinology. Uh, in the greatest controversy in the history of the Food and Drug Administration, I am the only American invited to meet with a group of their top scientists. I've testified all over the world on this subject, and I'm considered to be the person that, that knows as much as anybody living about the subject. Well, it's a pleasure to have someone with your oh. statute on our show here. Um, how, now, isn't cow's milk wholesome and nourishment, and isn't it good for humans to drink? Well, why don't humans drink dog milk, or cat milk, or pig milk? The idea is disgusting to us. Why do we drink it from a cow? This big beast weighs a thousand pounds. We're drinking something with hormones, with pus, with bacteria, with pesticides, with antibiotics. Yuck. Yuck. Wait till you hear the things that are in milk. It's going to become a big surprise. Okay, so, uh, but doesn't the calcium build strong bones and the liquid meat protein of milk, doesn't that build strong muscle mass? Well, the protein that they tell you is so good for you, 80% of all milk protein is something called casein, C-A-S-E-I-N. Casein is the glue that's used to hold a label to a bottle of beer. Casein is the glue they use to hold together the wood in your furniture. You drink a quarter of a teaspoon of casein, you make one quart of mucus in your body. This is a foreign invader. Your body looks at these proteins and creates histamines, and the histamines make mucus. The average American is drinking 40 ounces a day of milk and dairy products. It represents 40% of our diet. It's 900 pounds a year. This is something that is the most overwhelming food factor in our diet. These proteins, what are proteins? We look at things like adrenaline. Adrenaline is a protein. Trust me, you don't want to be sending your kids to school with adrenaline in the morning, and you don't want them to eat estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and FSH and LH and prolactin and 59 different bioactive hormones. That's what they do in cow's milk. That uh, seems to be quite a, quite a cocktail. Well, yeah. How did we get so acculturated to drinking milk? Well, I blame it on the pilgrims. The first group of people that came to America, the first winter, 15 of the 18 mothers starved to death. They had no food. They planned on taking food to them to the New World. In order to leave port, they had to pay port taxes. They sold the 4,000 pounds of butter that these 100 pilgrims had on their ship. They knew in subsequent years they were going to need something to survive. So three years later, a ship called the Charity brought them the first three dairy cows in a bowl. That was the start of the industry. In those days, they only got one quart of milk a day. Today, it's 40 quarts a day from a cow. Those days, it was one quart of milk a day to churn for two hours into a quarter of a stick of butter. That was the start of our dairy industry. A quarter of a stick of butter is, what, two tablespoons? That's hard work. That's that what they that had to do. Surely is, and that's what they survived on for the first winter? Well, they stored the butter underground, they used spring and summer and autumn. The first Thanksgiving feast, the Indians fell in love with one food, rancid butter. You don't think there was a pilgrim sneezing behind a tree in the woods, wiping out uh, half a million Abenaki and Wampanoag Indians. <laughs> this was leukemia, salmonella. Just a few weeks ago, the government had to recall 300,000 cases of Land of Lakes butter and cheese and milk because of listeria. We've got bacteria like uh, tuberculosis, leukemia, a number of diseases that mankind have gotten. Dominican Republic, in the start of February, 1,000 kids got sick. Incredible. One day in school because of 22 different bacteria in milk. How did, how did you get involved with, with being the not milkman? Well, I was probably the biggest milk, cheese, ice cream, butter eater in the state of New Jersey. My family, I have three little girls, and our school system decided to change their milk supply at the same time that a company called Monsanto was genetically engineering the cow's natural growth hormone. They made it artificially, injected it back into cows. This was a big controversy. I read an article. I wanted to find out more. And it was just about one person, me, reading an article in a health newsletter written by Dr. Heimlich, the Heimlich Maneuver Doctor. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that started me on this journey. Well, wow, that seems to be a worthwhile journey. The book is a fascinating read. Um, I know, I personally know that 75% of the world's people do not drink milk. Um, how many other, <coughs> how do other countries rate in diseases in contrast to their consumption of cow's milk? Well, let's look at the one tribe in Africa that drinks milk, the Maasai. These are, these are- They also drink the blood. Yes, they mix the yes. milk with the blood. Yes. Um, this is one out of 40 tribes that live in Kenya or Tanzania. This is the only tribe that has bone disease and heart disease and they get cancers. The only one of the 40 tribes. We look at the countries with the highest rate of milk consumption. They're the countries with the highest rate of bone disease. They're the countries with the highest rate of breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease. This is not a coincidence. For each one of these things I've mentioned, I can give you a reason, a physiological mechanism. I can tell you why it happens. Uh, name, right, name the disease. Right, right, um, osteoporosis. Bone disease. In order to absorb calcium, for every milligram of calcium, you need an equal milligram of magnesium. Magnesium is the center atom of chlorophyll. We find that protein inhibits calcium absorption. When you eat a lot of protein, your body creates an acid condition in the blood. And in order to neutralize it, you have to leach calcium out of your bones. Women, when they go through menopause, what happens is they're not producing estrogen and progesterone. That's the key factor to losing bone density and bone mass. Harvard University is doing a study with 80,000 nurses now, and they found out that dietary calcium plays little or no role in preventing osteoporosis. Because we take in so much dairy, our body is well, still trying to process milk it? is liquid meat. We're talking about too much protein. It's not necessarily dairy. The average American last year ate three ounces a day, only three ounces of meat or chicken, and 40 ounces of milk and dairy. That's the average American. It's the number one factor in our diet. It's because it's so diverse in our diets with cheese and yogurt and sure. different dairy products that we think that we're having something different, but it's still the same product. You ask the average American, do you drink milk? And they say no, but they're putting it on their bagel, they're putting right. it in their cereal, they're yeah. eating the pizza, they're having the ice cream. What's That's the milk? correlation between milk and breast cancer? Absolute. Countries with the highest rates of breast cancer, Denmark, Norway, Uruguay, Holland, Sweden. You wonder why Uruguay is on that list. They have the third highest rate of milk consumption, third highest rate of breast cancer, and here is the reason why. There is a hormone in milk, when it was discovered 20 years ago, it looked like insulin, so it was called insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1. That hormone, remember hormone, that hormone in milk, IGF-1, we have in, in, in nature 4,000 mammals, we have a half a million different hormones, there is only one hormone exactly alike between two animals, IGF-1 in a cow and a human. In our body, it's the most powerful growth hormone, and it makes everything grow. And what happens when you drink milk, you're taking the most powerful growth hormone you make, a hormone that has been identified as the key factor in the growth of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So basically, when a cow has a calf and is nourishing the calf, it's got the first colostrum mm -hmm. that helps activate the immune system of the calf makes the calf grow. And naturally, after the weaning process, the cow would shun. Right. You're interviewing me. I'm going to interview you. you I'm just, I'm just <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a question. Let's think sure. about human breastfeeding. Okay. Does breastfeeding work? It did for me. Well, does it work? Think about it. I would theory. think so. Uh, sure. So would I. A uh, nursing human mother gives the infant lactoferins, immunoglobulins, right. protein hormones. Well, if breastfeeding works, think about drinking cow's milk. That's a form of breastfeeding. Those hormones are going to work too. There was a doctor's newsletter in May of 1995 called the Townsend Medical Letter. And in that letter, they listed 11 symptoms from drinking milk. And symptoms number eight, nine, and 10 were mood swings, depression, and irritability. So imagine sending your kid to school, talk about ADD, attention deficit disorder, send your child to school with a belly full of milk, with mood swings, depression, irritability, with all those different hormones I mentioned, it's going to happen we're not going to be able to study. Now, to make matters worse, let's go back into what happened in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about different kind of disease aspects. Now, we're, we're in the age of genetic and biological technology here, which I, I call the age of modern Frankenstein. Um, what did they splice the gene to give it the bovine growth hormone. 
Well, let me, let me explain very simply. They took, on one hand, the cow's natural growth hormone, bovine growth hormone. Pigs have porcine growth hormone. Humans have human growth hormone. They identified and took the cow's growth hormone, and they took an E. coli bacteria. E. coli. E. coli is a very easy bacteria to grow. Every 20 minutes, they make a new generation. So they took it only because it's, it grows in our gut, but it's very common in nature. So they took the E. coli bacteria, they opened it up, they opened up the genetic material right. from the cow's hormone, mixed them together. They grew a new kind of bacteria that would naturally grow that hormone. That's very simply what genetic engineering is. So they keep these bacteria in a cauldron that specifically grow this hormone. They can do that with other hormones. They can do that with insulin and with estrogen and testosterone. Right. They did it with the bovine growth hormone. They grew it quickly, cheaply, so they could isolate it, inject it into a cow, and they found out the cow would produce 15 to 20 percent more milk. What is the, what is the, the side effect of this? Well, what happened was a lot of interesting side effects. Cows were born with genetic deformities. Cows were born with a lot of twins, which caused miscarriages. Cows got something called mastitis, which are ulcers on their udders, so the cows were putting more blood and bacteria and pus into the milk. As a result of that, um, Monsanto, who made the hormone, knew they had a problem. They didn't want cows having more bacteria in the milk, so they arranged to have their top dairy scientist hired by the Food and Drug Administration. Oh. Monsanto had their scientist hired by the FDA? Yeah, let me go back one step. This is a very good company, Monsanto. I love Monsanto. Monsanto has brought a lot of gifts to, to the world. Agent Orange, dioxins, uh, aspartame, a very controversial drug, uh, this bovine growth hormone. I found a study, and this is really what I got started with. I found a study in which every single laboratory animal got cancer from this hormone. And I went to the FDA. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. You can find out who John Kennedy went out with and probably Clinton, too. You cannot find out about all the animals gotten cancer. This study was authored by Richard O'Doglier and Deslex. I filed a Freedom of Information Act. I went to federal court in New Jersey. I said, Your Honor, every animal got cancer. I have half the study here. During the midst of me trying to get it, we signed a law called the Economic Espionage Act, which would have put me into jail if I released the study. Monsanto got their top attorney hired by the FDA, Michael Taylor, Tipper Gore's first cousin. He wrote all of the labeling laws for the new genetic engineering. He replaced another Monsanto attorney, a man by the name of Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas. Um, Monsanto, the president. He's sitting on the Supreme Court right yes. now. Just in case, this reads like a John Grisham novel. It sure does. In case these issues ever get to the Supreme Court. They took their top dairy scientists, Margaret Miller, Susan Station, hired by the FDA to review their own research. See, I'm an investigator. I'm a tenacious investigator. You certainly I are. I know the science. And I found out that Margaret Miller, a week after she was hired by the FDA, knew that the animals were getting ulcers on their udders and putting more bacteria. She changed the amounts of antibiotics a farmer could legally put into milk. She increased by 100 times. It used to be one part per 100 million. She increased it to one part per million. Right after that, consumers' reports in the New York area tested milk, found 52 different antibiotics in milk. We've been drinking 52 different antibiotics. You think antibiotics don't work any longer? Of course they don't work any longer when you need them because we've overdosed on them for, for the we've last uh, six, seven years. We've become immune to them. We've become immune to them, not by taking antibiotics when, when we need them, when we're ill, is because we're consuming them, and this is just milk. And not only that, there have been new strains of emerging viruses. I'm going to give you an exclusive. I haven't done this in an interview yet, anywhere in America. And I'm all over America doing radio interviews and TV interviews. And you're going to do this on the Oaklander. Yes. I'm very excited you're going to get exclusive about this. here because excited. I've been researching this. I found out about a bacteria in milk called Yersinia, Y-E-R-S-I-N-I-A. I looked on the internet because there's a lot of information on the internet. The FDA says there's never been a case of Yersinia in the United States, but the Center for Disease Control lists two on the internet, one in Arkansas and one in Tennessee. Yersinia has another name. Uh, historically, it's been called the Black Death, bubonic plague. They have a special arm of the CDC that only follows Yersinia rumors. We've got in milk Clostridium. We've got Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, which doesn't give a human TB. It gives you irritable bowel syndrome. Direct link between milk and Crohn's disease. 80% of the cows in America have this bacteria. Some of them get something called Yoni's disease. They have constant diarrhea. They can't eradicate it. 
60% of the cows in America have bovine leukemia virus. Al, we're drinking body fluids from diseased animals. This is, this is incredible because uh, one of the things that I see, and it really is a sore spot with me, it's the line, it's the economy, stupid. Is our economy based on people who get cancers, people who suffer from diabetes, leukemia, is this our economy that is based on, on curing diseases that we invent for ourselves? Is that what the economy is all about? It seems kind of curious. We have a key factor in cancer, IGF-1. There it is in milk. This is a secret that is so big, it's bigger than anything the cigarette industry have, uh, ever had. We have diabetes. Let me tell you about diabetes. I told you the number one protein in milk is casein. The number two protein in milk is called lactobumin. Lactobumin, they found, destroys the cells in your pancreas that produce insulin. These are called, um, the, well, this was published in the Journal of Pediatrics in June of 1992, the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 1992. As a matter of fact, the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics said, no child under the age of one should ever drink whole milk because they're a candidate for insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. This is shocking. Dr. Spock said never drink milk. Nobody. We forget his words. But This, but is, this is really in, incredible because when we look in the other countries around the world, um, in China, doctors are paid only when you're well. <laughs> That's very interesting. Think about it. it. I guess they don't have an, a problem with their economy over there. I guess maybe they're stupid or something. But it's, a, in, it's incredible on how they look for natural cures for their for their maladies instead of inflicting maladies on their own people just so they can have a robust economy. Well, it's interesting. I don't know we talk about this tonight, but medicine, our medicine, could have gone in two directions. At the turn of the century, there was Louis Pasteur. There were two French doctors, Louis Pasteur and Beauchamp. Pasteur felt that it was foreign invasions of virus and bacteria. Beauchamp felt, keep your body strong, you're going to resist these things. And they were both right. They were both right, but yes. Pasteur actually wasn't a doctor, and he stole much of his work, work from Beauchamp. But we find that we are what we eat. We talk about heart disease. The average American today from milk and dairy, from the cheese and butter and ice cream, mm -hmm. will eat the equivalent cholesterol contained in 53 slices of bacon. You can't One glass of milk? No, the, the average intake. Oh, all okay. of the ice cream and cheese and butter added together. For example, it takes 10 pounds of milk to make a pound of butter, 12 pounds to make a pound of ice cream, 21.2 pounds to make a pound of butter. Now, you add all of those things together that the average American eats. Today, you're going to eat the equivalent cholesterol from your average dairy intake as contained in 53 slices of bacon. Imagine your doctor saying, Al, I want you to eat 53 slices of bacon today because the cholesterol is good for you. As a matter of fact, do that every day this year in 1999. I want you to eat 19,345 slices this year. As a matter of fact, by age 52, I want to make sure you eat the same cholesterol contained in a million slices of bacon. It'll do great things for your heart and for my practice. During the <laughs> Korean War, we autopsied American servicemen. And the doctors doing the autopsies found they all had heart disease. They all had this new word, atherosclerosis. Hardening of the arteries. Yes, butter growing in their arteries. And they said, aha, it's the, it's the American diet. Average American is eating three ounces of meat with the dangerous animal fats and 40 ounces of milk, cheese, butter, ice cream, yogurt. It's in everything. And that's what we have here. So basically, if you had a few ounces of, of animal um, meat a day, wouldn't be quite as bad as all the dairy intake that we eat. Let me explain why. Let me explain why. That's what you're here for. Whoever designed our stomach did a great job because the acid in our stomach is so powerful. The pH, which is the way you measure right. acidity, is about a 1.8. If you take your finger and dip it in your stomach, it'll go down to the bone in about three minutes. That's powerful acid. Right. If you take a 12-ounce glass of milk and you pour it in your stomach, you change the acidity from a 1.8 to a 6.0. You look at More cholesterol. More alkaline, almost neutral. In other words, the hormones survive digestion. Cholesterol is basically a steroid hormone and a sugar. That would be chopped up into its basic components. At a 6.0 pH, it's not chopped up. It survives digestion. It does not pass go. It goes directly to the heart. So if you ha oh, because it passes through the gut. Through the circulatory without. system. Now, if you just had a large meal, mm -hmm. maybe you had a piece of steak or a mm -hmm. pork chop or something, 
and you finish it off with a glass of milk or maybe an ice cream sundae or something. Ever hear of reflux? Ever hear of indigestion? Wouldn't that cause, again, more problems in the digestive area, your irritable bowel? Sure. Well, does that connect, does that, is there any correlation between colon cancer? You, yes, you would not leave that steak out for 10 minutes in 80 degree heat, but you'd put it in your stomach to ferment and putrefy for five hours. If you eat steak and broccoli and a potato and a salad three nights in a row, but on the third night you drink a 12 ounce glass of milk afterwards, you're gonna teach yourself a little bit something about digestion. Everything will sit there an extra four hours. You will have to secrete more acid and you're gonna feel it. You're gonna have indigestion. The milk changes the acidity, and that's what this is all about. But isn't it okay because we can give you an, a Pepsid AC or something? Isn't that right? Why give yourself the antidote? That's Don't what, take the poison. That's why we have you on the show. <laughs> that's why. Um, are we having any adequate safeguards in the industry of biotechnology to protect us from these frankenfoods? Unfortunately, and you use a good word, frankenfood, unfortunately, those companies that do research, Monsanto, for example, invested a half a billion dollars, $500 million. They submitted 55,000 pages to the Food and Drug Administration when they did this drug. And they knew that animals were getting cancer. They knew they had some problems. But what could they do when they had such a big investment? I made a discovery. I discovered when Monsanto submitted all of the research, they had to draw a chart of what this hormone looked like. And they said it's indistinguishable from the natural hormone. I made a discovery that they created a freak amino acid. You ever see that movie, The Fly, where the scientist goes in the chamber and a fly comes in and they merge their DNA? Oops. Oops. Well, amino acid, this is a little technical, but amino acid number 144 should have been lysine. They created a freak called epsilon n acetylysine. I found a publication in a very obscure British trade journal by a Monsanto scientist admitting this, that they made a freak. And by doing this, they invalidated all of their research and it should be taken off the market immediately, we have an explosion in America of leukemia. One out of seven women are going to get breast cancer. It caused cancer in every lab animal. I spent two years trying to get the Canadian government to review what America wouldn't review, and they did, and they've just turned down the bovine growth hormone in Canada, partly because Canadian scientists said, he's right, this caused cancer in all the lab animals. They only reviewed the first 90 days of a 180-day study. The others were stolen out of their files. In Canada, it's a major story. All over the world, genetic engineering is front page news. Not in America, though. No, it seems that nothing is really on the front page here in, in America. Luckily, the impeachment is over. Uh, but here again, um, people, Mike Espy was involved. Right. As far as the agricultural. Uh, now, he loved to go to free sporting events and things like that. Is there any connection between the uh, the Dairy Association, the Agricultural Lobby, and members in Congress? Because I haven't heard uh, I haven't heard anybody really speaking out of it. Well, actually, they don't really speak about anything. Well, Mike Espy, when he was in Congress, he was the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. Right. When he was in Congress, he was a member of a committee of Congress called the Dairy, Livestock, and Poultry Committee. He learned how to take money and make money when he was on that committee. The Dairy, Livestock, and Poultry Committee had an opportunity to label milk because Americans have a right to know. I got my congresswoman, Marge Rukemer, to co-sponsor a bill that 180 other people in Congress sponsored. They gave it to this committee to debate. That was back in 1994. They debated it for six months and stole the bill. This is how Congress works. So that the bill was never voted upon. And when the 1994 session of Congress expired, the bill died. Yes. I was so angry, I investigated the 12 congressmen on the committee. And what did you find? I found out that these son of a guns took a, to a total of $711,000 in PAC money. They call it PAC money. I have other words for it. They took money directly from companies having agricultural interests. Four of these men, Cretans, crooks, took money directly from Monsanto. People like Steve Gunderson and Cooley and Dooley and Pombo. I name the names. And I've used the word crook on national television. Thank you. And you think they would sue me if I'm saying anything that's wrong. They're running the other way because we've got evidence that they do this. This is how Congress works. PAC money is a matter of public record. People very rarely look. But when they're voting on a bill, when they're in the course of a judicial proceeding affecting a company, and they're voting on that, and they stole the bill, these people should be indicted. Um, or even worse than that. Well, I don't want to say shot. Well, I, th I, th I didn't want to say the word either. 
But um, it's something, $750,000 as far as a PAC donation seems to be a, a very small amount of money when if you figured that if you were to get something um, as pancreatic cancer or colon cancer, uh, that you could be in the hospital for virtually a year, year and a half, and have your entire savings. Well, this is what happens. We end up, the average American, and spends 20 years dying from a cancer or heart disease and giving their hard-earned money and their houses to their doctors instead of their children. This is terrible. I found Richard Nixon on March 23, 1971, accepting a $3 million gift from Dairyman in, in the Oval Office. It's recorded. John Connolly comes in afterwards and said, these men are adamant. They're going to place a lot of money into political activities. Well, they have. And they know where how to wisely invest their money. Every time people ask me, is there conspiracy? I say, look, the World Health Organization, they had a symposium in Geneva, Switzerland. It was written by Arthur Hall Hayes, who used to be the commissioner of FDA, went to work for Monsanto. You don't know that, do you? NIH, Ted Alsasser, used to work for Monsanto. You look every step of the way I look. Clarence Thomas, C. Everett Koop, have Monsanto connections. This is very interesting and how it science... it seems that all they have to do is to give us high-definition television, 65 channels, <laughs> maybe some Diet Coke, and we seem to be happy. We're very happy. What happened, what happened to the spirit of, of the 1960s when there was injustice that people wanted to make it right? We, that's why we have to take back our health. That's why you have to watch a show like this and read the books and read the newspapers and go on the internet and take these issues and decide them for yourselves. The doctors, ask your doctor next time you're in your doctor's office how many hours he or she took in nutrition. They don't know anything about nutrition. He sends you to a nutritionist. But he, he tells you, drink milk. It's healthy. Why? Because the dairy industry spends tens of thousands of, doctor, of dollars of doctors, exactly. They donate money to the AMA and to the Dietitians Association. As a matter of fact, the AMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, had two independent doctors study this issue about this hormone that's now in our milk. And every newspaper and magazine in America said the two independent doctors said it was safe. I investigated these guys. Michael Dalgaday, David Barbano, both worked for Monsanto. They weren't so independent. As a matter of fact, the JAMA article, anybody can look it up. August 24th, 1990, Journal of the American Medical Association, right on the front page, it tells you they work for Monsanto. Yet the interpretation of the newspapers and magazines where they were independent. This is how America works. They derive a lot of money, half a billion dollars a year in advertising with those stupid milk pustache ads. I read, I read um, <coughs> on, your, on your website, and I think it'd be a good idea uh, to give the website now. Is it www notmilk.com. We have a toll-free number of the, the anti-dairy coalition, 888-NOT-MILK, and we also have a website with a lot of free information. It's www.notmilk.com. The Great. word is not milk. Not milk. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of the effects of business, the way it, the way it all kind of um, works hand in hand through the government, through the industry. And now, again, I'm sure that there's people that may work for the dairy industry out there. But um, to get back to what I was talking about, I read on your website about Florence Griffith Joyner. Mm -hmm. Did I spell that right? Flojo. Flojo. Mm -hmm. And every, when, when she tragically passed away last year, people were thinking it was maybe steroids mm -hmm. or it was maybe um, illicit drugs. But what I read on your, on your website was something totally different. Could you tell our viewers about Flojo? Well, they said that Flojo died of a grand mal epileptic seizure. But when the coroner examined her tongue and mouth and cheeks, person having a seizure, you know, put a shoe in their mouth, they're going to chew their tongue off. They were intact. They were beautiful. They were rosy. And I spoke up. I spoke with the coroner. And I said, look at her stomach. What was in her stomach? The last meal that Flojo ate at 3 p.m., she died 15 hours later. At 3 p.m., they found in her stomach was 250 cc's, the size of a brick, of undigested cheese from pizza, mozzarella cheese. You know what it looks like in the box when you don't eat it? Right. How hard it gets? Yeah. It was like a brick <clears throat> in her stomach. She was putting out histamines 
Every organ in her body was congested, acutely congested with mucus. I have part of her autopsy on my website. I'm the only person that got outside of the coroner's office her autopsy. Tracheal, bronchial tree, the lungs, thymus, kidney, pancreas, spleen, you name the organ, it's acutely congested with mucus. Al, we have a half a million kids in New York City, African American, Latin American, that have asthma. And these children are below the poverty level, so they get free breakfast, free lunch, free snack, because their nutritional needs are lacking, and it's milk and cheese. It's this protein casing. You look at my friend Spike Lee, who does his milk pustache ad, probably to pay for his front row seats at the Knicks, and he does this ad, 95% of African Americans are lactose intolerant. This man is doing a milk pustache ad. Larry King just had triple bypass surgery. He wants you to take garlic powder to lower your cholesterol. So he's eating the same cholesterol every day in, in 53 slices of bacon. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, she did a milk mustache ad. She will not drink milk. She was interviewed in Teen Magazine. They had the Rugrats doing a mu milk mustache ad. These cartoon characters under the age of one with a chocolate milk mustache when I got a letter from the Undersecretary of Agriculture saying that's inappropriate because they know a child drinking milk is a candidate for diabetes. So the dairy industry hires Bill Clinton should be impeached. He did a milk mustache ad. He he's should. A, he's allergic to milk. He never serves ice cream in the White House. He won't serve cheese because he'll go into anaphylactic shock. He's highly allergic to milk. Mm. Yet he took the, well, he, I don't know if he took the money. Maybe he did. They gave it to, uh, to Nixon. I'm who, sure. Who knows what goes on. Robert, we have to take a break now. We're a bit over, over time right now. But we'll be back with Robert Cohen, uh, author of Milk, the Deadly Poison, in just a few moments. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is my recipe. My grandma makes the best tortillas. It's home to me. Well, it's part of my culture. What do you have to do to make them so round? Try my best, that's all. My secret is using my grandma's recipe, of course. I love tortillas. I will eat them with anything. I don't think anybody makes them exactly the same. Kona, one of these homes here in the little village at Chimaya, and you'll have a good tortilla. They're delicious. <laughs> good. Excellent. Welcome back to the program. Um, Robert, what would our viewers do if they wanted to uh, either test their diets or uh, what would they do to replace milk and dairy products from their diets? There's no nutritional need for milk and dairy. If you're used to eating the cereal, you can go to the health food store or even the supermarket. You can find soy milk or rice milk. There are many alternatives. But I'll tell you something, we tried them at home. My kids occasionally eat them, but we've discovered now that you can eat anything for breakfast, you have for dinner, it tastes better, it's easier to digest. We have the fruits and the vegetables, they're delicious. Leftover spaghetti, leftover Chinese food is delicious. Give it to a kid, it's healthy. They'll digest it and do better in school. Any other final thoughts that you'd like to um, tell our viewers at home, Robert? Sure, I tell Americans when I do the lecture tour, Try a little experiment. Go five days, don't eat any milk or dairy products. I want you to see what it's been doing to your body. And on day six, I want you to start your day with yogurt, and I want you to have a cheese sandwich and some pizza and ice cream for dessert, and you better have one extra thing, Al, an extra roll of Charmin, you're gonna need it. Discover what milk really does to your body, and that's gonna be discovering the fountain of youth, because when you give it up, you're not gonna have that, that terrible, terrible casein or the lactose intolerance problems, or the hormones, you're going to discover the fountain of youth. That's fascinating. Robert, thank you so much for being our guest here. Thank you. And I'd like to have you back when you finish your, your expose on aspartame. Be a pleasure. And that would be another wonderful show to share with our, with, with our viewers. We'll, uh, we will return um, in a few moments. Please stay with us. Saying goodbye to your old car can be like saying goodbye to an old friend. But the parting can become sweet sorrow if that old friend saves lives through the National Kidney Foundation's Kidney Cars Program. Donate your old car and the funds will support programs that can save lives. We'll even arrange a pickup and you might qualify for a tax deduction. Call 800-63-DONATE, the National Kidney Foundation's Kidney Cars Program. It puts the good in goodbye. Hi, I'm Richard Karn. Did you know that mowing the lawn can be hazardous to your eyesight? Nearly one million Americans have lost vision from an eye injury. 
and almost half happen at home while doing routine chores using cleaning products or power tools or even mowing the lawn. It happens every day. So be smart. Wear the right eye protection because an accident can happen in the blink of an eye. For more information, call Prevent Blindness America at 1-800-331-2020. I'm joined now with Patrick Laird. Uh, Patrick Laird is the third chair cellist in the North New Jersey Junior High School Orchestra. And Patrick will be performing a couple of numbers for us. The first one is by Squire, the Tarantella, and he will play Golterman's Concerto Number no. 4. Patrick, take it away.
came here when I was in kindergarten <laughs> and the only way I know that is because there was another actor who lived there and uh, he had a, uh, a son in my kindergarten class and they had a party and uh, they we all you know were taken up there to this um, the name is leaving me now I should have thought about this before but they only lived here about a month after that, and then he sold it to Sidney Kingsley. But he was an actor also. Well, Sidney was a playwright, and Madge Evans, his wife, lovely, lovely people, both of them. And um, it was fascinating to have a star in town. Um, he wrote more, I don't know, do you have more books under there of his? He wrote The Patriot, which was an, uh, Broadway play and detective story, of course, was famous. And uh, he did more than that. Men in White, he wrote that also. And um, he was just a regular guy. Brought a lot of stars to Oakland. I remember uh, sometimes watching, you know, the train when they would get off the train at night. If you would see his car down here to pick up somebody, you knew there was a star coming, you know. And um, Veronica Lake that used to wear her hair over her eye like that. She came and then we went up through the woods one time to watch and we saw her out playing tennis at their home. And uh, yeah, I can't think of another. This is a wonderful uh, piece of uh, sewing, our tricentennial quilt that was done for the 300th anniversary of the exchange of land to Arlette Schuyler. 
Um, the, the panels have traditional um, symbolic pieces and it also has some interesting things for new for uh, Oakland. There's four panels that the river wrote, uh, runs through for the four seasons. <laughs> this panel is the Lenapes, uh, the early peoples who uh, with the Minsees were in this area. We have uh, this one is to symbolize the Copper Beach Tree, and that's where the Grand Union Shopping Center uh, is that huge yeah, tree that's there. So there's a, a modern part, uh, some other things that represent Oakland today and Oakland in the past. This is the Van Allen House, the Dutch uh, farmer who first uh, lived in this, uh, in this house, the small part, the keeping room area this, in this part. This is more the 1700s that this uh, two-story colonial part was built. The um, traditional uh, piece there for the Ponds Church, okay, which was a center focal of, uh, of Oakland's, uh, at the time called the Ponds, when they first came to uh, this area. The Dutch settled the Hudson River and so to Oakland. I'd like to thank our guest this evening, Writer, researcher Robert Cohen, author of Milk, the Deadly Poison, a fascinating look at how the truth dealing with our health goes ignored in the face of profits earned. Our thanks to Midland Park Patrick Laird for his renditions of Tarantella and Concerto No. 4 on the cello. And if you would like to share your thoughts, your views, your talents on the Oaklander, give us a call at two we have tonight. Please tune in next month to see what we're, uh, we have in store for you then. So for the Oaklander, I'm Al DiGiacomo, and thank you for watching.